After the incredible victories that turned around 1942 at places such as El Alamein, Stalingrad, Guadalcanal, Midway, even Coral Sea, the Allies uh, had a new strategy for 1943 and early 44, and this was to not just check Axis advances, but to take the, the war home to the Axis homelands themselves. And to accomplish this, they were counting on two or three logical trains of thought. The first was that their industrial engines were now really firing at full speed. It will be the sweat of workers that tips the beam, the sweat of American workers who will give you men tanks and planes and guns to fight for our free and democratic world. The Russian industrial plant had been destroyed at Leningrad and at Stalingrad. But most of it had been saved and was now safely beyond the Luftwaffe or the German panzers beyond the Ural Mountains. Same was true of the United States, that nobody could reach the industrial plant. And after, oh, say, September of 1941, there was no serious uh, German assault on British industry. And even the Blitz itself had only damaged about 5% of British. This was in contrast to the bombing that began in 1943 of Italy, the bombing that was now 24 hours against the German mainland, and uh, the uh, carrier attacks on Japanese holdings in the Pacific. So the Allies were thinking, at some point, we're going to get a critical tipping point where we're just outproducing the Axis and we're destroying what they are producing. And the two together will give us a, a, a real quantitative edge. There was a second part of this reasoning, and that was true. The Axis started in the late 1930s Army, and their weaponry, whether we look at the Mark III tank, Mark IV, Japanese Zero, ME-109, were superior to ours. But it doesn't mean that their science was superior. It just means they had a head start. By 1943, the Allies are starting to say the advanced Spitfire fighter, the new Hawker uh, Typhoon dive bombers, the American P-38 Lightning, but especially the P-47 and the P-51, and the Pacific, the Hellcat and Corsair fighters, are not just as good as Japanese and German model, but they're superior. The Russians are saying our T-34 is better than the German Mark IV, which was supposedly the best tank in the world. And while it is perhaps outmanned by the new Panther tank that's coming in in late, middle 1943, it is much more numerous. The Americans are saying the Sherman is not a very good tank as far as its protection or its uh, velocity on its barrel or its offensive power, but we can make thousands of them and they're the most reliable, um, easy to main tank in the world. So the Allies are basically saying to their own armies, we have more stuff, and it's as good or better than the Axis, and it's going to get even better month in and month out. The Axis idea that we are craftsmen, and we are making superior weapons of war, and we have superior fighters by our race, or our training, or our national ideologies, is proving not to be true. But that's still the second thing that the Allies are saying is, besides this material edge that we're going to work on, we have to have a propaganda. You are in enemy country. Be alert. Suspicious of everyone. We have to have a national ideology just like they do. And Roosevelt and Churchill get together and they say this is the Atlantic Charter and we're going to have United Nations and we are going to wage a war that respects national sovereignty and allows people freedom of choice. Now, this is a really hard thing to do if you think about it, because their partner is Joseph Stalin, who's killed 20 million people in the 1930s and occupied all of the Baltic states and, and southern Finland. So he's not necessarily going to fit that mold. And second, it doesn't mean that Winston Churchill is fighting for the same Wilsonian ideas that FDR is. He wants to preserve the British Empire. But the logic of it is you can't really try to free Europe or free the Pacific and then have uh, colonies overseas. And the British say to us, 
well, you can't really be on the side of freedom and then not let African Americans, for example, participate in your military. So there's a lot of contradictions in this idea that we are fighting a war for freedom, but it's sort of left with the idea we're fighting a war more for freedom than those guys are, and that is true. The third and most important strategy as we get into late 19, middle 1943 to, to middle 1944 is do you have anything other than a vague objective of how to destroy Tokyo Roman in Berlin? I mean, we all know we have to destroy them and destroy their ideologies and occupy it. How are you going to do it? Because even though we're more powerful and even more the world is starting to choose sides in our favor, their supply lines are shrinking. It gets easier to supply its possessions, as the German army in the east and west are not separated by 3,000 miles, but finally only by eight or 900, 1944, it's easier to supply them. So we have to come up with a strategy that's, that's logical. And in the Pacific, we say, there's two ways to go to Japan. Now that we've got Guadalcanal, we've saved Australia. You can do Douglas MacArthur, who's still angry that he had to leave Corregidor, before it fell in May of 1942, he very much wants to get to the Philippines. He wants to go from Australia to New Guinea and the Dutch East Indies, and then take the Philippines, take Peleliu on its flank, and then from the Philippines go to Formosa, and then free the conquered Chinese people, liberate them, and then go from the east to Japan. The Navy, Ernest King, and Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz say, this, this is not the right way. If you look at Guadalcanal and you want to end the war, you go straight to Tokyo. You don't do a cartwheel, Operation Cartwheel, it was called. That is, we go from the Gilberts, we go to the Caroline Islands, we go to the Marshall Islands, we'll go into Tarawa, Kwajalein, and then we'll jump up to the Marianas, Saipan, Tinian, and Guam, and then from there we'll go to Iwo Jima, and then from Iwo Jima we'll go right to Okinawa, and each Along the way, we will skip islands that we don't need necessarily to take, and we'll make airfields, and we'll get air support, and we will go to the homeland of Japan by island hopping. And there's a big debate, and in typical American fashion, there's no consensus, and we try to do both at once. In other words, we're going to give half the supplies to MacArthur in the Pacific, and he will go very successfully and quite brilliantly through New Guinea and on his way to the Philippines, and in late 1944, there'll be a cataclysmic battle at Leyte Gulf, and we will destroy essentially the Japanese fleet, and he will land finally at Lutzan in the fall, and by February the Philippines will be occupied by Americans and liberated. And we will go all the way up in these terrible battles at Tarawa and Kwajalein, and finally in the late summer of 1944, we will get to the Marianas. And at that point, there's kind of a puzzlement because if you look at a map, the Philippines is kind of on the same latitude as the Marianas. And Nimitz is saying, this really worked. And MacArthur said, this has really worked. But the problem is, Nimitz has the argument because he's saying these new B-29s have a range of 1,600 miles. They did not work in India. They did not work in China. They were too far away. They had to be supplied. Now they can be supplied by sea. They can fly 800 miles all the way to Tokyo cope and bomb them and get back to the Marianas. They cannot do that from the Philippines. It's too far. And when you start to go to the left, to the east, for most of you, you're not taking the direct out. You're not making it easier on air crews. And you're not maximizing the full efficiency of the U.S. Navy. And Douglas MacArthur will eventually lose that argument. So he will be consolidating in late 1944 and 1945 the Philippines. But he, MacArthur, will not really dramatically go into Formosa, nor will he go into Korea, nor, nor will he liberate China. Instead, the American strategy will be once we've conquered the Mariana Islands, which we do in 19 late 1944, and we build these massive 7,000-foot runways, and we bring this new B-29 bomber, which was more expensive than the Manhattan Project, a million dollars a plane, the cost of a destroyer, we are going to start bombing long-range Japan, and maybe, just maybe, we can bomb them in a way we have not been effective in Europe yet. But at least we have a strategy in the Pacific. Two prongs aimed at Japan, one prong will finally dominate, and then with air power and naval power, we'll isolate Japan, cut off its oil, bomb its cities, and just maybe we won't have to have an invasion of the homeland. 
For Italy, we have a much easier strategy. The British come to us and say, you're not prepared to go into Normandy. You can't invade France in 1942. You don't have the experience. You don't have the amphibious craft. You don't have the wherewithal. But we do have the ability to go in and drive Rommel out of North Africa. And this will be a practice session for you. So in November of 1942, we land in Morocco, Vichy, France, colonies in the North African coast. They immediately collapse. And the Americans, it uh, takes us a while, but finally we make George Patton Army Group commander. And we start to drive eastward. Montgomery drives westward. And this, in about a year, they're going to, less than a year, they're going to culminate in Tunisia. And we're going to bag a larger group of German and Italian prisoners that was lost at Stalingrad. 250,000 will surrender in June of 1942. And then we say, we've got to get into Italy. We're not ready yet for a cross-channel invasion. Churchill never wants to do it because he keeps saying, if you go through Italy, Italy's the weakest of the three axes. And when you get done with Italy, you end up in Austria. And if you end up in Austria, you're on the east side of Germany. So when the Soviets come, you're there, and they don't take over Austria and Germany and France. And we say, yeah, but from Belisarius to Napoleon, nobody's been able to go up the Italian peninsula. It's narrow, it's mountainous, it's ideal for defense. Um, this is a backwater. It's not going to work. And we don't want to think of geopolitics and communism and capitalism. The Russians are our friends. Let's not get into that Machiavellian, Churchillian. And so there's a compromise. And we will take Sicily in July of 1943. And then we will go into August, September, October into Italy. And by June of 1944, we will take Rome, but we will never take Italy, just as the Americans warned Churchill. Maybe it was the lack of George Patton as senior commander. He slapped two soldiers, so he was isolated and demoted. We lost a valuable year of his leadership. Maybe it was the incompetence of Mark Clark. Maybe it was the inability of the British and the Americans to work together. Maybe it was the brilliance of General Kesserling and his series of fortified retreat lines. But whatever the case was, Italy becomes a backwater. It succeeds in only one dimension. It gets rid of Mussolini. So by early 1944, there are only two axes. There is uh, the Germans and the Japanese. And there are appendages in Europe that are on the Russian front. So we have a strategy. And the strategy in the European theater is pretty good. We've knocked out the weaker axis, and now we knock out the stronger one. And just as we had this debate over the best way of getting to Tokyo, we have now a great debate, what's the best way to get to Germany? Under Hap Arnold, the Army Air Force says, you saw what happened in Italy all of 1943. You really don't have to invade the continent. We are now refining our tactics. We have a better formations. We have a B-17E. We have uh, a much faster, better armored plane. We have improved the Norden bomb site. We're starting to have drop tanks. We're starting to get escorts. We're starting to do real damage. And people say, well, you, you Swinefort and all uh, Hamburg, they, they, you might be impressive. But the only time you bring any results is when you carpet bomb and you burn up these cities, whether it's Cologne or Hamburg or even Berlin, and you're not you're not doing much. I mean, you're, there's a big debate because the, the Army Air Force says we're destroying industry. They're really not. They're only destroying transportation and oil, which is valuable. But the problem is that 10 million coerced workers have come in from Eastern Europe and all over Southern Europe, and they are replenishing German industry, which is being dispersed. So even though we were destroying German industry, it's increasing at a faster rate than we then we can destroy it. It's not sustainable, but it means that air power alone will not substitute for a second front. So what's the second strategy? The second strategy was the original American preference all along. We want to build up an island base in Britain. We want to go across the channel. We should go to Calais because it's a short 500 mile shot right into Berlin through the, the low countries. But the Germans will be expecting us. So we'll go down to Normandy. It gives us more space. And we'll get this enormous British, American, Canadian army. We'll land at five beaches, and we'll head to Germany, all 900 miles, right to Berlin, and we'll end the war. And this will uh, we'll meet the Russians. And the Russians are saying to us, when are you going to do this? When are you going to do this? When are you going to do this? There's a great tension now building between the Russians and the Americans. The Russians are saying, we have killed three out of four German soldiers. What have you done? 
and we are saying, you were on Germany's side until they attacked you. Had they not attacked you, you would be perfectly happy to continue to supply them with grain and oil and coal while they were using those materials to bomb Britain. So don't, t don't talk to us. And then the Russians say, well, where is your front? And we say to the Russians, you're not fighting the Japanese. We are. You don't have a Lend-Lease program. We do. We had set out to become the arsenal of the free and fighting nations. We were determined to supply them with our war goods, whether they could afford to pay or not. You're not fighting the Italians in North Africa. We are. You're not fighting them in Sicily or Italy. We are. You're not conducting an anti-submarine campaign. You're not even conducting a submarine campaign. You have no convoy system. You have no battleships. Are anybody bombing strategically German cities from Russia? No, you're only doing one thing. You're just fighting on your homeland because they attacked you. And they're saying, blah, blah, blah. All that matters is we now have 15 million people in the Soviet Red Army and its affiliated Air Force and Navy. We've lost 6 million. We've lost 6 to 7 million civilians. And we're still fighting. And we never give up. And we are killing Germans that would kill you. And so a loose consensus comes that we will finally go into Normandy, and we will relieve the pressure off the Soviets, but we don't want to feel that we have to because we've been relieving the pressure off the Soviets. They've been, the German army has transferred all of these assets that have made the Soviet army really go. And if you chart the day-by-day -day progress of the offensive Red Army after the Battle of Kursk in summer of 1943, its daily incremental advance into Eastern Europe and Germany is absolutely predicated on the number of bombing missions that the Allies conduct against the Third Reich and the progress of the war in North Africa and the war in Sicily. And how it works out in the here and now is that every time we go into Sicily or into Italy or every time we send a, a long-term operation against Schweinfurt, a Luftwaffe a flight of planes is transferred westward, or their Das Reich division, or their Hermann Göring division is transferred, or a battery of 88 flat guns is, is transferred, or a whole division of support troops are transferred, or the Ruhr Valley uh, industries are diverted to the west. And so as we enter 1944 mid-year, the big event is the successful Normandy landings in June of 1944 where the British and the Americans and the Canadians very quickly will get about a quarter million soldiers. Now the problem with Normandy is that if you look at the map, it's in central France and it's got a long way to go into occupied Eastern Europe. And the British have come are in the north and they have a shorter route, but still you're landing on the beaches. You are not able to take the ports because the Germans have made fortified fortresses at Brest and Cherbourg and there's no way you can supply uh, suitable uh, armaments, food, munitions, et cetera, for a sustained offensive. We had these two artificial mulberry one, uh, harbors. One is destroyed by a storm. But we don't have enough supplies. The second thing that we have a problem with is we studied the sand. We studied the water temperature. We studied the water currents. We knew every inch of Normandy. And the invasion is brilliant. We put 100,000 people there within 48 hours, and we only lose 3,500. The feat of putting ashore a highly mechanized army is stupendous beyond anything in the history of warfare. Nobody studied what goes beyond the next 10 miles at Omaha Beach. It was a bocage or a hedgerows, which are medieval small one-acre plots with thick hedges that are almost impossible to penetrate, especially when you have Germans with tanks and machine guns embedded within them. And so this is one of the great tragedies of the American experience in World War II. After that brilliant landing in Normandy, all of June and July is spent losing 80,000 casualties to go no more than 20 miles into France. Another thing is starting to happen in our uh, assault against the Axis power. It's not just we're going to beat the material, we're going to have better, uh, a better message, and we're going to have a long-term strategy to get to the capital. It's not just that. It's that Leadership, generalship, strategic thinking is going to be better. And what do I mean by that is that Stalin in 1941 and 42 is an awful supreme commander. The people who are heroes of Leningrad, he has shot. He dismisses all the arguments about Marshal Zhukov about the Kiev pocket. However, after these enormous losses, he begins to outsource 
control of the war to brilliant people like Marshal Koniev and Zhukov. And they really know and understand military science. For all practical purposes, for all of Stalin's propaganda, it, the war is being run by people who know what they're doing. The same is true of the British and the Americans. We have, after 1942, we have found that we have a lot of incompetent commanders, Mark Clark, General Fredenal, et cetera. But the war is starting to distill people like Dwight Eisenhower is a great, very good administrator, George Patton, who's now brought back from his imposed exile. Omar Bradley is sober and judicious. We have some brilliant corps commanders, Matthew Ridgway fighting Joe Collins. Jim Gavin, and these people, Lucian Truscott, they're starting to get real responsibility. And more importantly, there are two people uh, who are very good as senior strategic planners, Alan Brook in England and George Marshall and Ernie King. And uh, they fight about where we should invade, or King fights with uh, Nimitz and he fights, fights with Marshall. But basically, these are very sober and judicious people. They know what they're doing, and they have superiors who are eccentric, Churchill and Roosevelt, but they listen, as Stalin is starting to do. They listen, and they correct their mistakes. If strategic bombing is not working, and it's not, then they say, we got to cut back until we get French airfields, and we can escort the bombers all the way to Berlin. We need a better fighter. We need drop tanks. And they establish that. If the convoy system is not working, they say, we got to systematically get B-24s and use them for naval observance so they can spot our blind spots and bomb U-boats in the sea. We've got to sharpen the radar, sharpen the sonar. So they look systematically and empirically at problems. Contrast this with the Japanese, contrast this with the Germans, and contrast this with the Italians. Mussolini, for example, bogged down in North Africa in 1940. What does he do? 1941, he invades Greece, doesn't even tell Hitler. Yugoslavia blows up right before Hitler's ready to go into Russia, slows him down for a month. 1942 started, Army Group South tells Hitler, we've got to constrict our lines. We've got to beef up. We've got to fight a defensive war. He says, no, we've got to extend the front 500 miles to the east. You're going to go to the Caspian Sea. And they said, we can't even supply ourselves in the Crimea. He tells General Paulus, not one mention of retreat. I'd rather have all 300,000 of you perish than save the Sixth Army. He, in November, he could have brought the whole Sixth Army back, and it would have been a superb fighting defensive force for Hitler. In other words, Hitler, unlike Stalin, never learns his lesson. And all of the superb and quite qualified German commanders, General von Rundstedt, General Guderian, General Rommel, General Bock, General Model, General Lieb, they are either at one time or another exiled, demoted, removed, temporarily put on ice, and he's surrounded more and more by mediocre yes-men, people like Jodl or Halder. So in terms of leadership, the Allies are getting better and better and better, and they're getting more and more empirical, and they're adapting to challenges and responses. And Hitler is getting more set in his ways. And Mussolini, after 1943, is gone. And in the Pacific, the army is still fighting with the Navy. And nobody believes that you have to have uh, sophisticated new dive bombers, sophisticated new fighters, because the, the vaunted zero is outmoded. It's outdated. It can't stand up the Corsair. It can't, can't stand up to the Hellcat that it's, it's ridiculous to send a 72,000-ton battleship like the Mushashi or the Yamoto against a carrier force that can spot it 400 miles away. But the Japanese are wedded to these successes and these ideologies of the 1930s. And so as we go into the, the sunset of the war, the Allies are outproducing, and they're building better weapons, and they're attacking the source of Axis supply in the homeland. Allied bombs smash at German production to back up the offensive on the Western Front. They have a strategy now. They've knocked out Italy out of the war. They have a strategy to get to Berlin on two fronts. And they have two complementary or maybe even competitive strategies to get to Japan. And they've got a group of leaders who really, really are seasoned now and understand everything from geostrategy to operational tactics. And qualitatively, the American soldier, the British soldier, and the Russian soldier are as good, if not better, than the German and the Japanese soldier, something that was not true in 1941, 1942, probably all the way to 1943. How is this war going to end? What's going to happen 
when the Soviets and the Anglo-Americans start to near the Third Reich, and it's not going to be very far. Once the Americans get through France, once the Soviet Union gets into Eastern Europe, do they stop? Do they divide each other? Does one get to have Germany and the other doesn't? What's going to happen when you have to make a decision with General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz? Where are you going to go? Are you going to go to Formosa? Or are you going to go to Iwo Jima and Okinawa? And how are you going to get these B-29s to actually shut down Japan if they're not having very good results? That's going to be the big mystery of 1945. And it's going to be solved with uh, some pretty astute leadership on the part of Stalin and Roosevelt and Churchill. And one of the great ironies of the war is that the Axis all sh have a shared ideology. Fascism, Nazism, German militarism is pretty similar. But that means they're going to be hom homogenous? No, they don't consult. Hitler has no idea what Tojo does. Tojo had no idea what Mussolini does. Mussolini has no idea what Hitler does. The allies are divergent ideologies. British imperialism, Commonwealth system, is antithetical in some ways to American idea of democracy and self-determination. Both are absolutely antithetical to Soviet-style, Stalin-style communism. And yet, at a series of conferences at Casablanca, Tehran, Potsdam, Yalta, before and after the war, they figure out a system that is complementary. And it basically works something like this. The Russians say, because you opened an, extra, uh, an open front, we will decide to stop. You will stop at the Elbe River. And you can go into Greece, and we can go into Austria. And we will have four sectors in Germany, French, American, British, and Russian. And we will jointly occupy it. And we will jointly occupy Berlin, even though it's in the, uh, the Russian sector. And neither side will make a private deal with Hitler. And we know what the Germans will do, because they fear us, because we've been waging an existential war, and they have been waging one against us. They will start to want to surrender to you, and you will not make a private peace. We also understand that as Hitler's lines contract and he gets more desperate, he's also more dangerous as any wounded animal is in his lair. So if he decides to attack us as we advance into Poland, you won't sit back where we take the brunt of the Third Reich. And if he attacks you in the third, in the Ardennes, in the Battle of the Bulge, in December 16th of 1944, we won't just stop, supposedly. In a dense fog, the enemy struck with a stunning force. The Allied line was opened, and the Nazi hordes poured into the breach. The U.S. 4th Division was in critical condition along the eiffel Ardennes line, and it was here that a great bulge began to form. And you won't stop bombing. And it works pretty well. There's some suspicions on both sides, but more or less for the end of 1944 and much of spring of 1945, the armies uh, progress at a, about an equal weight against Germany, and they understand where they're going to stop and how they're going to stop. Pretty much in the Pacific, we understand that General MacArthur has, for a variety of inexplicable reasons, but understandable, I suppose, he has the Philippines. He's going to occupy. It's going to be a much more difficult task than he wants. But we're not really letting him going to go into Formosa or China. We've already outsourced Burma and Malaysia. That's a British problem. The British are not going to go into Tokyo and stop the Pacific War. They're interested in one thing, protecting India. And, and if they tie down the Japanese in Burma, and if they, t if they can deal at some point with Malaysia, that's their problem. Us. Our primary strategy is going to go from the Marianas and take Iwo Jima halfway between Japan and start bombing. It doesn't work very well at first, but by March 10th and 11th of 1945, the Allies under Curtis LeMay, uh, the American Army Air Force, comes up with a really Machiavellian, devious, brutal, savage, whatever adjective we can think of. They take this magnificent high-level bomber that's designed to fly at 30,000 feet at 300 miles an hour that the Japanese can't touch and has 4,000 pounds of bombs and wears out the engines every 100 hours getting up there and has no results because of a 500-mile jet stream. They decide in a very, very dramatic change to take it down to 5,000 feet and to junk the high explosives and not to target industry. And even though they've told the British that they're precision bombers and that the British are...
amoral carpet bombers. We're going to carpet bomb Japan, and we're going to use napalm, a new industrial chemical from the DuPont company. We're going to come in. If it's 500 miles an hour and it blows our, tar our bombs off target, it won't matter if Tokyo is 30 miles long. We're going to drop the incendiaries, and the wind will not be our enemy. It will be our ally. It'll whip up the flames, and it will burn. And if the Japanese don't like it, we'll drop leaflets and explain what we're going to do. And we're going to say that you dispersed your industry. We had no choice. And so on March 10th and 11th, in the single most lethal air raid in history, uh, the American B-29 forces from Guam, Tinian, and Saipan burned down um, about 14 acres in downtown Tokyo. And it's the single most lethal day in the history of aviation. They kill over 150,000 Japan. And then the next six weeks, Curtis LeMay burns down most of the urban core of the Japanese municipal area. About 65% of all Japanese cities will be burned down by August 1st of 1945. And now we're set for the final denouement of the war. And the question is, can LeMay burn down all of Japan and force them to surrender? Or will Nimitz have to take Okinawa and then take the Japanese homeland? Or will these crazy scientists in New Mexico develop this other bomb that nobody knows much about that might do what LeMay's uh, grand plans of having a bombing force of B-24s or B-17s or B-29s might do? And can the Americans and can the Russians mutually destroy Germany? And then can they decide what Germany is going to be after the war? And more importantly, what you do with all these refugees and occupied territories and what you do to the German people themselves. And these are going to be issues that will be discussed in 1940, at the mid and end of 1945.